So we're thinking about keeping, uh, keeping your fire for Jesus burning. And just a little bit of a testimony, not, not a lot of it, but I'm not one of those people that has been on fire for Jesus and, you know, just exuberant spirituality bubbling over every day for my entire life. Okay, I appreciate people like that, but, <laughs> but I'm not speaking as an expert in that sense. I'm not sure if that is expertise to be continually exuberant. I think it's more temperament in some ways, and I thank God for people like that. But I, I have days, weeks where I'm just not in a great place, not, not thriving, and you know, it's not a constant state of enthusiasm. And, and I, I suspect that may be true for most of us, that there are some really special times, and there are some times where it feels a little bit flat. I think some of that is related to life. You know, sometimes you're just tired, uh, maybe physically tired, maybe stressfully tired. Sometimes ministry just takes, takes it out of you and, and you're just kind of running with very little fuel in the tank. Sometimes uh, it could be that there's a specific cause of a struggle in your life. Other times it's not a specific cause, it's just an accumulation of things. So I want to be realistic about all of that. I don't want to sort of give a simplistic, you know, if you just do this, this, and this, you will always be in a perfect place. I, I don't know that formula, and I suspect there is no such formula. But what I want us to do in the time that we have is think a little bit about the heart. What the heart is, the, there's a lot of biblical language about the human heart, what is it? And then how do we uh, maintain or grow that kind of heart level responsiveness, that love for Christ that I suspect all of us wish we had more of? Okay, if, you, if you're here thinking, I love Jesus too much, you probably are at the wrong entire forum, uh, let alone workshop. So, well, think about the heart, and then I'll give some suggestions. But let me tell you this before we even start, just to, to totally undermine your confidence in this workshop. We cannot control our heart. Okay, the, the heart, I'll, we'll explain what it is, how it functions, but we're actually talking about the one part of our lives that we're not in charge of. And that actually makes it a little bit difficult to say, so what do you do? There's lots of things you can do but you can't control. You're not a separate, autonomous, individual being that self-starts and self-initiates and self-determines. That's just not you. Maybe a silly example to, to help you understand what I mean. Um, is there a food you don't like? For me, it's, it's peanut butter. I just can't do it. I, it's no offense to Americans. Actually, lots of offense to Americans. Because when I was, I was in OM, and uh, we, I was on the ship, a missionary ship, and every day we'd have a morning break and an afternoon break. And you'd go down to the, the, the dining room, and there would be trays of bread, and there would be jam, and there would be peanut butter. And, and Americans don't get it. No offense. They don't get that some of us don't like it. And so, knife in, on the bread, knife in, on the bread, and, and bless them, they're thrilled with that. I'm married to one of them, and you know, they love that stuff. Some of us would go in starving. We're so hungry, and you pick up the jam, and you look in it. Can't do it. I, I couldn't eat the stuff, even with enough peanut butter to, to get the smell, but not the visibility of it. I'm not allergic. It's not a medical condition. I like to say I'm psychologically allergic to peanut butter, but I just hate it. My children, who are half American, five of them love it. One is loyal to me. <laughs> but five of them love it, and so they'll say, you know, they'll be putting it on the bread. Dad, do you want us to make you a sandwich? <laughs> and I go, no. And they'll, this is my favorite question that my children ask me, and they still ask me this sometimes. Dad, if you were in somebody's house, and they served you peanut butter, would you eat it if that meant that they could then become Christians? That's how much I hate it, that they would ask me that question. And I say, yes, I would eat it so that somebody could become a Christian. Of course I would. I'd eat that herring stuff. But, but I don't want to. And they say, well, you should. I say, well, I can't change that. Have you noticed if there's something that you just can't change your want to's? And that's, that's something about the human heart. We're not in charge 
and you can re-educate and reprogram and do all the things you want, I could take an advanced degree in peanut butter. I will never like it. Why? What if I want to? My wife tells me all the benefits. I even make it for my children with real peanuts. I mean, I know it's got protein in it. I cannot convince myself to like it because I don't. And that's just a little silly thing, but actually it, it goes to show that there's a part of us we're not in control of. There's a part of us that, that, that dictates other things. I mean, my dislike for peanut butter has fed into my thinking so I can give you a very strong rational argument why no Christian should touch it. There's no peas in it. There are no nuts in it. It's technically a legume, not a nut. There's no butter there. I mean, it's the total thing is a lie. So I, <laughs> I, you might think, why would you think about that? Because my heart doesn't like it. And so therefore my mind goes into action saying, okay, reasons not to like peanut butter and I have to stop myself from giving lectures about this, this stuff, right? This is the only time I've ever done it. And so my mind is doing what it's told by my heart. My body does what it's told by my heart. Here, have some protein. No, thank you. You know, worst thing is Americans hide it in cookies. And you get to a plate of cookies and you go, oh, that looks like a nice cookie. You take it and it gets to about there. You go, no, I don't think so. That's, where can I hide it? You know, so my body is controlled by my heart. My mind is controlled by my heart. And I cannot control my heart. So let's think about the heart. Because our culture and our traditions within our culture say certain things about the heart. Where do we tend to see heart kind of language or imagery? What, what is it used for in our cultures? Love, right? Especially Valentine's kind of expressions of romantic love. Sometimes, you know, a t-shirt, I heart Barcelona or whatever, you know, I heart Vishwa. Just the touristy kind of t-shirt. So it's used for that, for affection, for love, for liking. When you like somebody at school, you keep drawing their name with hearts, all that kind of stuff. So in English, I don't know if you have this in, in your languages, sometimes in English when, when someone says something and then they want to reinforce that they really, really mean it, they'll say, well, from the bottom of my heart. That's a ridiculous thing. If you think physiologically, I don't want to see the bottom of your heart. But they're not talking about the pump. They're meaning from the very core of who I am, I mean this. You know, or in English, little rhyme that children say, um, I know it's really true, cross my heart. It's like, kill me if I'm not telling you the truth. It's like, I really mean this. So there's a, there's a weightiness, there's a seriousness about the heart. And yet in the culture, there's kind of a, a fluffy silliness. It's like, oh, come on, we're, we're not like that. We're more serious. We're thinkers. You know, we're, we're not sentimental. Academic circles, the heart tends to get treated as silly. And so culturally, there, there is a sort of a sense that, that there's something about us that, that gets called the heart, that there's something at the core of us. But technically, what is it? I think if the moment we go technical in terms of how people work, most of us and most of our cultures reflect a tradition that says humans are brain controlled. Right, we are brains. And yeah, we have these feelings and affections and things, and you call that heart if you will, but, but you can't trust those. Trust your thinking. And so you'll have parents passing that on to the next generation. I would like you to clean your room. I don't feel like cleaning my room. So what does the parent say? Do it, and your feelings will follow. <laughs> right? I don't care how you feel. That doesn't matter how you feel. And there's all these statements that are coming through generation to generation that say basically how you feel or what you care about or what you love doesn't matter. At the same time, the marketers know that it matters. They put big money into it. I used to be a, a salesman. Um, we, I sold a a breakdown recovery service. Maybe you have that in your country. So if, you, if your car breaks down, you phone the number, you're a member, they send you a mechanic to get your car fixed. I knew that the heart was important in that. 
Even though people thought that they were being clever when they refused to join, I knew how to get them to join. We were trained in this as salesmen, totally secular. We're trained to target the hearts of our listeners, potential customers. So worst case was always somebody who drove a Japanese car. No offense to Germans, but the Japanese cars in England are seen as being even more reliable. And the ultimate is a uh, Toyota maybe, but Lexus. That's like a luxury Toyota. So if I'm trying to get somebody to join, you know, I'm waving a leaflet, I'm trying to invite them in, and, and somebody would come over to me with a really arrogant look and say, I drive a Lexus. And I used to want to go, you know, be annoyed with them, but that would ruin it. So I'd, I'd say, oh, that's interesting. Do you still want to, do you want to join? No, 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 I drive a Lexus. They don't break down. Oh, do you want to join? Why would I want to join? Um, are you married? Yeah, I've got a wife. Does she drive a Lexus? Yes, we have two Lexuses. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh. Uh, okay, any children? I've got a daughter. Does she drive? No, she's 16. Oh, so she'll be driving soon. Yes. Will she be driving your Lexus? I don't think so. I'm not going to let her near my Lexus. Okay, so she's going to be driving something else. That could break down. Your membership covers her. Oh, now he's interested. And now he thought he had this amazing argument that I don't need to have this cover because I drive a perfect car, which is wrong anyway. But once I start talking about his daughter, he's starting to lean towards me. And the way I could finish the deal is I'd say to him, look, even if your daughter isn't driving, if she's in a friend's car, and let's face it, some of her friends don't drive Lexuses, do they? <laughs> no, they don't. If she's in a friend's car and they break down in the middle of nowhere, what do you want to happen? Would you like some mechanic who nobody knows showing up in the middle of the night with their clothes hanging off them in an unmarked vehicle taking care of your daughter? Or would you like one of our bright orange vans with lights on and a nice uniform? And he says, where do I sign? Why? Because all the arguments about the perfection of his car are superseded by his love for his daughter. And so you watch advertising. It's not like it used to be. 30 years ago, advertising would be the man in the white jackets to show he's a scientist, because they always wear white jackets, demonstrating why this soap is better than this soap. Now they know that doesn't work. And gradually, cultures are realizing simply showing scientific experiments is a very poor way to advertise. Instead, it's much better to show a glimpse into a story and if you can see a, a child falling into the grass and getting their clothes dirty and a mother with a radiant, happy face just delighted by life, two seconds of that and you'll buy that soap. Why? Because you want what she's experiencing. That word want is important. That's getting to the heart of the issue of the human heart, right? The, the human heart is our wants. It's our desires. It's our values. So what does the Bible say about the heart? We've got a, a list here. Um, what, what does the Bible say? What verses come to mind? I'll let you decide, and then we'll check the list afterwards. So we've covered Solomon. We've covered Samuel. Jesus talks in terms of love. Speech. Jesus says something about what comes out of the mouth. Do you remember that one? Yeah. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Which means, by the way, when somebody says something rude and you say, that was rude, they say, oh, I didn't mean it. It's not true. They meant it. It's much better to apologize by saying, I meant it and I'm so sorry, than to say, <laughs> oh, I didn't mean it. Sometimes, of course, there's a misunderstanding. But, you know, if someone's like spewing out criticism and attack and, you know, they're swearing at you and they're cursing you, they cannot say, oh, I didn't mean it, I just said it. Even if they're drunk, I still think it's coming from somewhere. Okay, the connection from heart to mouth is massively important. Um, what else have we got here? Love, speech, sin. We've covered that, Mark 7. Paul and James. Anything in James? Talks about desires in chapter 4. Um, sin giving birth in chapter 1. The desires... Uh, for sin, which gives birth to death and so on. There's a sort of a, a desire-driving kind of concept in James 1. Paul, does Paul say anything about the heart? We've had Romans 5.5. 5. 
The most significant one that, that we don't want to miss is Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 24. And um, just very, very briefly, rather than going into detail, I'd rather kind of get through the notes and have time to think about it together. Very briefly, what he's saying to them, he's just talked about uh, kind of the, uh, the unity and the body of Christ building itself up in love and all that kind of stuff. And then he says, I don't want you to walk like the Gentiles do. I don't want you to live the way they do. I don't want you to act the way they do. And then after that, he says, do you too? And he gives three statements relating to the mind, darkened in their understanding, the futility of their thinking, or the, uh, something to do with their minds. There's, there's three statements. You can look it up in your language. And you'll see it goes action, mind, mind, mind. But that's not the end of the story. They act the way they do because they think the way they do because of their hardness of heart. That's the root issue. And then he goes on to say, but this is not how you learned Christ, which is a strange way to phrase it, a unique way to say it. Learned Christ, like there's been some kind of relational encounter that's transformative. You've learned Christ. And then he goes on to talk about renewed thinking and changed action. And so he's really focusing on the, the hardness of heart as a core issue. And it would be well worth taking verses 17 to 24 and just going through and trying to make sense of what he's saying and the flow of that paragraph. Some scholars, in fact, maybe quite a lot of scholars, as they're addressing language of heart, they struggle to know what to do with it because our traditions, educationally, have said that the affections, the value systems, the feelings, all these kind of heart types concepts cannot be trusted. We need to suppress those in order to elevate the mind and to make good decisions. And so often what comes through in scholarship, unfortunately, uh, is a sort of dismissal of the heart. And there'll be things said like, well, it talks about the thoughts of the heart. So it's clearly talking about thoughts, isn't it? You know, really, is it? I don't think it is because there's ways to express cognitive processing that is different than the thoughts of the heart or the desires of the heart. And so there's something biblically, if we can somehow release ourselves from a tradition that has totally brainwashed us into thinking that we are autonomous uninfluenced decision makers, maybe that the influence is not just the tradition of our culture, maybe that influence comes from Genesis 3. Maybe there's a hiss that comes from the serpent when we hear that idea that we stand alone, we can make our own decisions, we can evaluate and just choose freedom, freedom. Ooh, that's a little bit Genesis 3. Maybe what the Bible actually says needs to be heard by us that we are heart-centered creatures. That is to say, we are responders. Our hearts respond. And it's the values that are provided from that response that then influence the way we think and the way we act. And as a non-Christian, when you're spiritually dead, which way do you respond? It's not not fair to say that somebody who's spiritually dead is never responding to anything because they're clearly functioning and existing and they're, they're existing continually responsively, but they're not at all responsive to God. Hence, they are spiritually dead. Like the Holy Spirit can walk past them and they don't know who it is. Like there's no response there. Like, woo, anybody in? That's a spiritually dead person, but they're alive and they're functioning and they're acting. And so somebody who's spiritually dead is as much heart-driven as somebody who's spiritually alive. The difference is what? Is the heart made of stone or is the heart alive to God? And so on the notes, uh, I put on there, um, what does sin do to the heart? What does God do for the heart in salvation? I just said it. Sin has hardened humanity completely to God so that at the core of who we are, he doesn't matter. Luther, in his less famous theses, you've probably heard of the 95, look up the 97. Okay, I want you to join me in a, uh, a significant moment this year, September the 4th. All right, 
It's the anniversary of the 97 theses and people don't know what they are. You, you should have a party. Okay, you choose, have peanut butter if you want, have a, have a bar of chocolate, you know, have a drink if you're allowed, whatever you, you want to do, celebrate the 97 Theses on the 4th of September. Look them up online, have a read. In that, he talks about the heart. He talks about uh, how humans live or don't live, how we choose or don't choose. And as one of those Theses in there, he says, man does not want God to be God. He wants to be God, and he does not want God to be God. That's spiritual death. I want to be in charge, and I don't want you to be in charge. That's stony. That's a rock-hard heart towards God. That man will never choose naturally to do good things. He might do good things by our evaluation, but he will never actually do true good Because a bad tree can only produce bad fruit. For a bad tree to produce good fruit, it must first be made a good tree. So Luther is very readable. You can enjoy it. Don't stop before you get to about 40, 45. There's some good things in there. But uh, the 97 theses of Luther are kind of starting off talking about, is it possible for an unsaved person to choose to be godly? And the answer is no. God's got to do something. They've got to be transformed. And what does the new covenant say happens in us? What is the offer of salvation? We heard last night an absolutely wonderful presentation of justification, which deals with our our sin and our guilt so that our guilt is taken away. That's the negative part. But what's the positive part? We're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Wasn't that good last night? And what else happens? As well as having sins forgiven and being justified, we also receive within us the Spirit of God who unites us to Christ so that we can have a relationship with Him. And something happens to our hearts. They go from stone to living. And the law is written within so that we want to please God. Salvation does something in us way more than just a declaration of status change. That, of course, is the core of justification and so on. But there's something transformative that does occur within us as Christians. Which is why you even care about this workshop. Otherwise, honestly, the title, Five Ways to Keep Your Fire for Jesus Burning, I don't care. That's the response of a non-Christian. Why would I want to? I don't care about Jesus. He doesn't matter to me. The very fact that we care about Jesus the very fact that we care about our lack of care is an indication that God has done something and is doing something within us. Okay, so how do, how do we then, what do we do? Like, what, what, what does that mean? The heart's really important, but we can't control it. Is it hopeless? Is there nothing we can do? I think there is. And I think we need to uh, think carefully and understand what that, what that looks like. So uh, I've put five ways because, honestly, titles with something like five ways attracts people. Okay, so five ways. It's not like this is <laughs> some sort of you know, incredible insight. You know, if, if I was given the title six ways, I would have given you six. Okay, but I just said, oh, five's a good number. Okay, so number one, check your inclination. Inclination is which way you're leaning, which way you're, you're oriented. And I'm trying to be careful because it's really tempting to contradict everything I've said and, and, and basically tell you, do this, this, and this, and then your heart will be on fire for Jesus. But you can't control it. However, the Bible does talk about incline your heart. It's kind of like lean in the direction of, be responsive to. You know, because the Bible also says it's possible to harden our hearts. So there's a sense in which we can pull away from. Sin is always pulling us back towards self and back towards autonomy and back towards me in God's place. And so think of Hebrews, for example, in that early section. Today, do not harden your hearts as they did at Meribah. 
They were invited. They had opportunity to respond to God and they turned away. It's possible to be resistant to God's work in your life. And so I think we, we've got to start by checking our inclination. It's all very well to say, yes, I want to love Jesus. But if actually there's a resistance going on, that you're turning away, there's some sort of rebellion, that's an issue. And I'm not saying that you can fix it just by turning it, but I think recognizing it, you come to God and say, God, what is wrong with me? I used to be so on fire for you. Now I'm becoming cold. I'm becoming apathetic. This isn't right. I don't want this. What I want is to love you. You see, there's a clash of wants there. There's a tension of affection versus affection. There's, there's the spiritual life heartbeat for Jesus that we've, we've been given, but there's also the affection of the flesh pulling at us. We all feel that, don't we? Sometimes it's a pull into horrible sin. I really love Jesus, but I really want to watch that. Oh, yuck, what's wrong with me? Sometimes the pull is the other way. Yeah, I love Jesus, but I really love people respecting me. I really want to be impressive. But that's just as much a, a rebellion as the the gross alternative. So what's our inclination? Are we inclined towards God? Are we inclining our hearts? Are we looking for him to do something to us? I was just chatting last night with a friend and I was saying, you know, sometimes I read the Bible and I just feel kind of guilty because I don't, I don't love it and, and just explode with delight when I, when I read it. And I look back to times when I did and I think, oh, I've got to get back to that and I've got to work harder and I've got to study better. And do you know what I mean? I kind of put this pressure on myself. Or I go, I'm just too tired for that. So I'm just going to try and find something that's relevant or something that speaks to me. And I just kind of, Ugh. either way, it's a little bit me focused. Instead, maybe what I should do is come into the word and say, God, I want to see you. I'm inclining myself in your direction. I'll be honest, I haven't, I'm not, you know, I'm not on fire right now. I'm kind of struggling. I'm tempted. In fact, I'm significantly distracted by the sport and I'd rather be reading that. But no, I, I want you, Jesus. So show me something of, of what you're like. And I think there's something about that just inclining towards him that says not, I can fix me, but it says, God, I need you. And that's different than God give me something I can apply in my life today. It's much, much different to that. It's much more relational. It's much more looking for him in the text. And so incline your heart. You can't control your heart. You can't dictate to your heart. Your heart's controlling you. But the Bible says incline your heart and do not harden your heart. Know that you can resist the Spirit of God and pray that he would help you not to do that. So the first thing there is incline your heart, check your inclination. Number two, confess your infidelity. That sounds pretty harsh. I don't know why I use those words, but confess your sin. But I used infidelity because what is sin? It's not just breaking rules. It's, it's when we turn from him to anything else. That's infidelity, isn't it? from a God who has given everything and offers everything and we've got everything in his son and it's all ours. All that I am, all that I am, I uh, share, I give to you, all that I have, I share with you, the language that Mike used last night. God's like that towards us and we go, yeah, but I really prefer this. That's, that's infidelity, whatever that thing is. It doesn't have to be gross and immoral. It could just be I'm comforting myself by wasting time on something else. Do you see the, what I mean? So if Romans 14, 23 says, whatever is not of faith is sin. And if faith is our looking to him and entrusting ourselves to him and depending on him, then whatever is not of that is sin. Confess that. It could be what we call sins, you know, You've got to stop that habit, stop going to that place. You know, maybe that TV show isn't good for your soul and you kind of know it, but you keep going to it. Maybe it's a kind of, oh, that's sinful. Or maybe it's just turning to something else instead of him, even though that thing, that something else is technically not sinful. Whatever is not of faith is sin. 
could be that instead of enjoying relationship with God, you're throwing yourself more and more into ministry. But not of faith, but effort. Trying to make up for the fact that you don't feel close to him. The very ministry you're doing, therefore, could be sin. Do you see, do you see the significance of that? So why do I say confess it? Duh. Because confession is turning our hearts back towards him, right? It's like I've been focused on me. Lord, I confess that. And so I think there's a place for confession that we've lost in the evangelical church. Since the Catholics do confession and make a big thing of it, we sort of do the opposite of the Catholics, you know, a sort of anti-Catholic swing. And so we go, oh, I don't do confession. Oh, you probably should. It doesn't mean you go to the priest. That's not going to be too helpful. But go to your priest. Go to Jesus. Have you ever noticed how it works on a human level? When somebody confesses, a sin. Not, not a silly confession like, I'm sorry if what I did offended you. I just teach my children, that's not a confession, an apology, that's barely a sentence, that's horrible. I'm sorry if what I did offended you. That's not an apology. I say, look, this is what I did, what I did was wrong, I am sorry, will you please forgive me? That's an apology. Now you watch when that happens. When somebody confesses, brother, sister, when I said this or when I did this or you expected and I didn't and whatever it is, What's the result of that? I always find that the, the result is this. Whether I'm confessing or forgiving, I always feel like I love the person more. Right? I never go, yeah, I forgive you. Ugh. That person drives me mad. I always feel pulled towards that person. And so confessing to God, saying, Lord, I've strayed, I've drifted, I'm sorry, whatever it is that His Spirit puts His finger on, I can talk about... Ten sins, and you think about a different one. That. Talk to him about it. Don't do confession to tick the box and say you've done it. Talk to him about it, and you'll feel drawn closer. Number three, celebrate your salvation. My goodness, I was going with a, a C thing on these notes. That doesn't happen when I preach, I tell you. It only happens when I do these notes for ELF. Check your inclination. Confess your infidelity. Celebrate your salvation. Um, Probably a better word, really, is be thankful for. But let's go with celebrate, because that's, that's nice. Uh, celebrate your salvation. What are you thankful for? I was just chatting with another friend who's gone through a... Uh, he was talking about a season of real depression, like just a very tough time where he just felt like he hit the wall and could barely function. And, and I was talking to him about, okay, so how, how do you function now? You know, I want, to, I want to understand, what does that mean? What does that look like? You know, am I struggling with some of that stuff? You know, I, and, and he said, I tell you, I, he said, I, I, I used to think this, was, this kind of thing was silly, but now I keep a gratitude journal. And he said, every day, three things. One thing from the last seven days that I'm thankful for and two other things that I'm thankful for, and I write it down and I thank God for it. And he said, I used to think that kind of stuff was so, oh, come on, don't be silly. He says, now that thing helps me stay alive. Gratitude does something in us. In Romans 1, when it's talking about a culture that turns away from God, it says they did not give thanks. What is it about thanks that connects us to God? Again, it's like confession. It inclines us back towards him. You know, when you're thankful, there's a connection that's taking place. When you thank a friend for all that they've done, there's a connection that's taking place. And so I think it's a very good idea to celebrate your salvation, whether it's, you know, put on the worship music and have a special moment in the shower, or whether it's, you know, through tears and, and the agony of depression, writing, I'm thankful that I'm still alive. Thank you, God, for not letting me die this week. You see the, the extremes of that, but either way, it, it's inclining the heart back to him. Number four, actually, still number three, uh, just as each uh, of us is prone to specific distraction, we're also stirred towards God in different ways. I don't see how this relates to thankfulness, but it works for a concept. Maybe this is part six. Um, recognize that each of us has a different way of relating. You do with other humans, right? I've got friends that I love to watch football with. I've got friends that we never mention sport. You know, we've, we've got 
uh, different, they've got different ways to relate, therefore I relate differently. I prefer certain conversations to other conversations. Each of us have a, has a different way of relating to God. So here's a list of things uh, that may be, I don't know, may be helpful. I think I got this mostly from Gary Thomas's book, Sacred Pathways. If you want a book that may be helpful, I think at least the titles are good. I don't remember the book particularly, but he said that some people really feel close to God when they're in creation. You know, walking through the woods um, or by the sea or whatever. Some people just getting out into creation does something in their soul. If, if that's you, do it. Some people are very sensory, art or music, even smells, depending on the tradition you grew up in. Some people find a certain smell like, you know, kind of lifts them into worship. I don't mean smells from the 1960s. Okay, I did once have to read a book that had a chapter in it that asked the question, is an LSD-induced high a spiritual high? And that was a serious issue in the 60s. I'm not talking about illegal smells, okay? But for some of us, you know, I don't really understand that one, but for some people, apparently certain smells can, whatever. Um, but know yourself, maybe even talk to God about it. Say, Lord, help me to understand how I can best draw near to you. And it may be that, that God is like a good friend and, and it's almost as if he'll say to you, you know, I love going for walks with you in, in, in the creation. And you might say, well, yeah, God, but I've got a friend who really likes the smell of incense or whatever. And God might be like, well, yeah, I enjoy that with them too. But with you, I really like, you know, so make it conversational. Don't just analyze yourself, but talk to God about it and say, you know, what, what can we do together? that can help me to feel closer to you. Some people love tradition, the traditions of the church and the traditions of worship in certain ways, even you know the certain building styles, the awe of a cathedral. Some people feel very close to God in that. Some people does nothing. Some people feel close to God when they're busy. That's an evangelical issue, I think, but, but often, um, you know, I, I can feel quite close to God being busy in ministry. Beware of the Martha trap. Okay, the Martha trap in Luke 10 is that she was busy first instead of Jesus first. If you read through Luke 10, there's this section right before where Jesus is teaching, uh, and it's talk, uh, the person he's talking to is talking about love God, love your neighbor, love God, love your neighbor. And that order matters. And then we come to a couple of ladies, and one of them does it the other way around. Mary loves Jesus first and is very willing to help in the kitchen. I'm sure she gets a bad rap, but she wants to hear what Jesus has to say. And Martha is loving her neighbors, these 13 guys that are sitting in her living room. And she's out in the kitchen and she's preparing the food. And, and if we were able to press pause and step into that kitchen, we could say, Martha, what are you doing? Don't you know you should love God and then love your neighbor? And she would give a classic evangelical answer. I am loving God by loving my neighbor. Thank you very much. Now, if you could get out of the way, I've got work to do. I imagine she'd be snappy with us. She was snappy with Jesus. But actually, we've got to be careful of that. As good as it is, some, sometimes serving God does a wonderful thing. You know, you have this thing where you're with him, but it can burn you out, it can drain you if you're just giving, 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 and it's good to sit at his feet like Mary and let him love you before you love others. So uh, beware of the Martha trap, but some people, maybe, maybe some of us need to be active in order to, to thrive spiritually. Some people in a very similar way are caregivers, and they never feel closer to God than when they're caring for other people. You know, maybe particularly caring for, like an old person or a child or whatever. That's, that's great. We're all different. Be aware of the weaknesses of that. Talk to God about it. Get to know who you are. Some people love planning and dreaming. I'm often like that. And I can feel really excited spiritually by having a conversation about what we could do. You might think that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. But we're different. You know, and God's willing to meet us in different ways, so that's cool. Celebration, obvious one, the worship music kind of thing. Um, for some people, that doesn't do much, interestingly. It's still the right thing to do, but some people, that's like a oxygen for other people. It's just contemplation. Some people just need to 
have time to think and think about God and meditate on His Word and be alone. Some people, and I've left this to last for a reason, feel close to God through study. Don't criticize them. You might not be one of them, but you know, thank God for them. Some of them are really helpful to us. All of them are in some way, but some of us, you know, we can, I can look at a text very closely and study it and find myself stirred spiritually. And so that kind of a list can be helpful, but, but notice what I put after it if you look at the notes, which I think is a thing of the past at ELF. But um, after that list, I say, understand that the Bible is not an option in that list. It's not one option. The Bible is the vital ingredient in all of them. When you're walking through creation to talk to God, it's your times in the Bible that are going to feed your understanding of that God. You know, when you're sitting in a, in a huge cathedral, just overwhelmed by the wonder of God's greatness and majesty or whatever it is, it's your Bible reading and Bible input that gives you a filter to understand what it means to know this God. And so whether you're a studier or not, we all need to be Bible people. The Bible is not a spiritual option. It is the spiritual resource apart from the Holy Spirit and each other that we've been given, and it is unique. Okay, so I think if we can start to view the Bible as the means by which we can know the God that we want to be close to. And so we're going to come on to that in a second. So Bible is really significant. I also mentioned there, recognize the Christ-given necessity of remembrance. Jesus anticipated that we would struggle. And so he said, every time you come together, do this in remembrance of me. And he gave us that visual representation of his body given and his blood shed. And so for some of us, yeah, that happens regularly. You might be in a church where they do communion once a year or once a quarter or something. Let me encourage you, even if you do it alone, do it more often than that. Jesus anticipated that we would drift and that focal point however it's done that brings us back so all of that stuff together is is still about inclining our heart towards him it's figuring out where do i feel close to him what what kind of dates can we have together you know what's the the me and god thing that sort of fires the connection pray for god to help you to understand yourself okay then number four i put soak in the scriptures i switched from c's to s's but i kept the sound it's quite i think i was quite excited at the time. So check your inclination, confess your infidelity, celebrate your salvation, soak in the scriptures. The scriptures, the Bible, are the spirit-inspired revelation of God's heart ultimately revealed in Christ. The problem some of us have is that we've grown up or we've learned that the Bible is a manual for living. You ever heard that idea? Like, if your car breaks down, you check the manual or map or something like that. In English, people make the unhelpful statement of Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. <laughs> Please don't teach that to anyone else. May this be the generation where that one finishes. It's way better than that. The Bible's where God reveals himself to us. No, I want basic instructions. You've got a problem, okay? God reveals himself to us. And so soak in the scriptures because that's where we encounter him. Instead of seeing this as a source of suggestions for living or a data bank of theological information, we've got to start recognizing that this book is alive because it's revealing him. And so instead of this being the thing that I study because I want to be able to answer questions in quizzes that Christians do at New Year or whenever it is, and I don't want to lose next time around, so I'm going to read my Bible. Instead of doing that kind of thing, every time we come into God's Word, Lord, I want to meet you here. Would you show me what you're like? Show me your heart. Reveal yourself to me. Why would I pray that? And specifically in terms of the heart. Why would I ask God to reveal himself to me? There's a verse in 1 John that's really important. We love, or we love God, because what? You finish it. Because he first loved us. Because he loved us first. 
He's already loved us. And the Bible shows us that. Therefore, if we go there looking for him, our response can be love for him. It's fanning the flames, right? He loves us still, right? The love of God is poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that he's given to us. And there's an amazing connection between the Spirit within us and the Spirit who inspired the Word of God. Like the, the Spirit-inspired Word of God just kind of goes zzz with the Spirit within us. So there's the record of God's love and there's the presence of God's love and there's this electric connection. doesn't always feel like it. But we go into the Word looking for Him instead of just looking for instruction. We're more likely to find ourselves loving Him, which is our goal. Does that make sense? We can't force ourselves to love him. We can't turn on love. We can't say, right, today I'm going to give God 10 uh, loves. You know, pump up the love and there it goes. No, my love is a response to his. The clearer I see him, the more I love back. And sometimes that's a moment of great worship and celebration after hearing the word preached and you're just like, oh, this is awesome. Other times... You, you got tears and it feels dark and it feels heavy and he feels distant and you say, God, I don't even know if you're listening anymore. I don't even know if you're listening, but the only way that I, in my heart, I'm going to get any sort of love for you is if I see that you've loved me first. So Lord, I'm coming into your word. Help me out, please. I'm pretty desperate. And so both extremes, it's the same thing. He loves us. We love him back. And so therefore, soak in his word. Soak in the scriptures. And then the last one I put there, and I'll just give you this. This is slightly disjointed, but hopefully helpful. Serve with him, not just for him. I imagine all of us are involved in ministry in some way, whether you're pastoring a church or leading a small group or doing evangelism, whatever it is. We're all involved in some sort of ministry. The danger is that we can turn that into the duty that we do for him. After all, he commanded us, didn't he? Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. Okay, yes, sir, I'm going. And we go do it, and we find ourselves draining. <clears throat> Somehow it helps to notice that in the Great Commission, Jesus didn't just say, therefore, go make disciples, baptizing and teaching. Amen. Boom. What does he say next? Yeah, I'm with you. Lo. I love that. In the Old English, you might not know Old English Bibles. They used to say, lo. It's kind of like, behold, check it out. Get this. I am with you always. Like We're not supposed to miss that final statement till the very end of the age. And somehow it's different. When I think, oh, it's another Sunday. I've got to go into church and I've got to preach and I've got to talk to people. That's even harder. Oh, yeah. Sometimes, you know, I can fall into the trap of thinking, oh, Lord, I'm going to do this for you. I don't often struggle in that way. I quite enjoy my church. But, you know, I, I can feel like if I'm doing it for him, it's just draining. But when I remember, now, hang on a second. He's building his church. These are his flock. He's the shepherd, not me. I'm just an under-shepherd. He's the one that's going to bring, bring about transformation. I'm just pointing them to him. And the cool thing is I'm not pointing them to someone who's, you know, 2,000 years away. He's with me, and I'm with him, and we're together. And Jesus, I'm going to church. Sorry, yeah, my mistake. We're going to church now. And I'm excited to preach your word. And I'm excited to see what you do through it. And somehow that last verse of the Great Commission sort of puts electricity in spiritual ministry, in Christian ministry, in a way that so easily we don't, you know, we drain because it's hard work, you know. Lord, what do we do today? Who, who are we going to chat to? Who, who can we encourage? Who do you have for us, Lord? Let's go. I suspect my days would be better if I prayed that in the morning. More we and less I will. You know? But actually, there's the same thing in, uh, in John as well. Great Commission in John. Notice the elements of the Great Commission in Matthew. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, uh, go make disciples. Or actually, therefore, go make disciples. Uh, of all nations. Uh, make disciples is kind of the command, but there's a push there, all right? And then there's the baptizing and the teaching. 
the two elements, the bringing people in and the building people up, and the lo, I am with you always. That's the Great Commission in Matthew. When you read John, what do you get? Yeah, we'll get to that one in a second. So when, it's, when he starts in, in chapter 20, it's, it's kind of spread out. It's interesting. It's different, <laughs> different but the same elements. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me as the Father sent me. Go make disciples, I send you. Baptizing and teaching, that comes in 21. It comes in the form of a practical illustration for the disciples when they're reminded of the time that he called them to fish for people. I'll make you fishers of men. It was the previous time they fished all night and caught nothing. And so they're reminded very tenderly and graciously, hey guys, your mission is to fish for people, not for fish. Okay, so there's the fishing, the bringing people in. And then Peter has that conversation with Jesus, you know, the, the three-part conversation that we've all uh, pondered and felt challenged and encouraged by. What's he say to him three times? Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. So there's fishing and there's feeding. That's like baptizing, bringing them in, and building them up. Fishing and feeding. It's the same elements, but it's being demonstrated to the disciples. Where's the low I am with you always to the very end of the age? Go back into chapter 20. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Same elements. So when the disciples were going out fishing and feeding and ultimately following Jesus, eyes on him, they weren't going alone. They were looking to him and it was the Spirit's role to point them to him. And so we can take that away and ponder it, you know, as you're flying home tomorrow or driving. Just think about it, going back into your own space, your own ministry zone, and, and say, Lord, what? what does it really look like for me to be joining you in this instead of just serving you in it?